Take a look at these images. Do they look like something from the distant past to you? Like something from before your lifetime? That may be the case, but in truth, this is a world not so different to our own. To bridge that gap in time and space, to truly connect to history, to start to understand the lives and experiences of the people in the pictures, you just need to look through the right lens. And sometimes that lens is fiction. Berlin, 1940, a shabby residential apartment block. Parents Otto and Anna Kvangel receive word from the front that their only son has been killed in the war. Up until this point, Otto has been living an unremarkable life as a factory foreman, just trying to stay out of trouble under Nazi rule. But this deep loss sparks him into an extraordinary act of resistance. He begins to write anonymous postcards attacking Hitler and leaving them across the city for other people to discover. If he's caught, he'll be executed. Hitler's regime will bring us no peace. Hitler's war is the workers' death. German people, wake up. These images here are the real deal, taken from the actual historical events that the novel, Alone in Berlin, by Hans Fallada, is inspired by. The names are different, the details vary, but the heart of the story remains intact. There really was a bereaved couple who struck up a campaign against the Nazis. There really was an ambitious Gestapo officer who was out to catch the culprit. And there really was a whole array of ordinary working class citizens dragged into a murderous game of cat and mouse. What the novel does that historical documents perhaps can't do is take us inside the hearts and minds of these characters to experience what they experience and to feel what they feel. And it turns out in 1940s Berlin, whoever you were, what you felt was fear. In the chapter entitled The First Card is Dropped, Anna waits outside an office building while her husband Otto goes in to surreptitiously drop one of the postcards he's written for someone else to discover. I'm not really afraid, she thinks. I'm not afraid for me. I'm afraid for him. What if he doesn't come out? She can't stop herself. She has to look at the office building. The door is pushed open. People come, people go. Why doesn't Kvangel come? He must have been gone five minutes, no, 10. Why is there a man running out of the building? Is he calling the police? Don't say they've caught Kvangel the very first time. Oh, it's more than I can stand. What has he got himself into? And then we're inside the building, alongside Otto, as he makes the drop. Suddenly, Kvangel takes out the card, lays it cautiously on the windowsill, pulls the glove off his hand as he begins walking downstairs and puts it in his pocket. Climbing down the first few steps, he looks back. There it is in bright daylight. He can see it from where he is now, the big, legible, bold writing on his first card. Anyone will be able to read it and understand it too. Kvangel smiles grimly to himself. Written with the pacing and tension of a thriller, Alone in Berlin expertly depicts how life in a totalitarian regime is infused with fear and suspicion, and not just for average citizens. One of the novel's most compelling characters is the Gestapo inspector Eskerik, charged with finding out who is behind the postcard campaign. We see him act with real cruelty as he interrogates witnesses, but we also see how fragile his own position is. The threat of exile or execution also hangs over his head every day, and over his superiors, and over their superiors, all the way up to Hitler himself. Fear is the fuel that powers the whole machinery of the state, and every single character's fate in this book is determined, to an extent, by their response to that ever-present danger. In 1911, two teenage boys made a suicide pact. They decided to make the event look like a duel, as they thought that would be more honourable. But because of their inexperience with firearms, they made a mess of it. One boy died, and the other survived. He was found innocent of murder by reason of insanity, and began his first stint in a mental institution. The surviving boy, Rudolf Ditson, was now a social outcast, but he did find an outlet in writing. He adopted a pseudonym and tried to shape a new identity for himself to leave this tragic event behind. He became Hans Fallada, author of Alone in Berlin. Hans Fallada is a kind of composite name from the Grimm's fairy tales. 
Hans is the lead character from a story called Hans in Luck, and Falada is the name of a magical talking horse. It's as if, by claiming this new name, he committed his whole being to the role of storyteller. Years later, he found himself living through the events which would inspire his greatest work, the rise and fall of Nazi Germany. As many of his peers were arrested and interned, his prospects as an author in this environment looked bleak. One of his novels was turned into a film by Jewish producers, so the Nazi party certainly had their eye on him. At one point, his home was ransacked by the Gestapo, who were looking for evidence of anti-Nazi activities, but they never found anything. His British publisher made plans for Falada and his family to be whisked out of Germany to emigrate and escape the regime. The bags were all packed, and on the day of departure, he took one last walk around the lake near his home. He then declared that he could not leave and told his family to unpack. I could never write in another language, nor live in any other place than Germany. As World War II raged, Falada came under pressure from Nazi politician Joseph Goebbels to write anti-Jewish material. While incarcerated in an insane asylum, he seemingly agreed to this racist propaganda project in order to procure paper and writing materials. He then produced reams and reams of densely overlapping encoded script to form the novel The Drinker a deeply critical autobiographical account of life under the Nazis. It was an act punishable by death, but he was never discovered, and he was released from the asylum in 1944 as the regime began to crumble. Shortly before his death, he told his family that he had written his first great novel. Hans Falada produced Alone in Berlin in a white heat of just 24 days of writing, but he died before it was published. It was only translated into English in 2009. So, was it worth it? Does writing a few postcards make any difference to Otto and Anna? Does their campaign ultimately mean anything? I'll leave you to discover that for yourself. But consider this. Reading a book like Alone in Berlin is as close as we can get to the actual lived experiences of people from the past. We can watch films, documentaries even, look at photographs, or read meticulously researched historical accounts. But novels have a very specific, special kind of alchemy that makes the lives of others feel, if only for a short time, like our own. A skillful novelist performs a kind of magic trick, propelling us into the imagined interior experience of another lulling us into a deeply intimate relationship with people we will never meet. Indeed, they may never even have existed. We're not just watching their lives, we're living them. As people strive to invent more supposedly immersive technologies to enable greater connections with one another, perhaps the ultimate empathy machine has already been invented, and it's made from paper and ink. Alone in Berlin puts us straight into that shabby apartment block and lets us feel what it might be like to live under Nazi rule. It lets us consider how we might respond or how we might hope to respond. What we learn from that reading experience, how it might shape our worldview or influence our actions in our own lives, well, that's up to us as individuals. But perhaps the first step in attempting to understand one of history's grimmest chapters is to bear witness. I'll leave you with this quote from the New York Times. To read Falada's testament to the darkest years of the 20th century is to be accompanied by a wise, somber ghost who grips your shoulder and whispers into your ear, this is how it was. This is what happened. You've been watching The Portly Raven, where we devour great books and then crow about it. Please do like and share this video, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to support the creation of more books-related content just like this.